let me uh, begin with a welcome. This is, I'm Jonathan Feng. I'm uh, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and one of the organizers of this series. And on behalf of all the organizers of this series, uh, it's really my pleasure to welcome you today. This is the uh, last talk of our fifth season. And so there are now 35, 34, will be 35 talks on the web for, uh, for you to view. What Matters to Me and Why is a um, series that's, uh, at least we like to think of it as quite a unique series here on the uh, campus. We're, of course, used to having lots of academic talks, and of course, there's very good reason for that. But this is a little different. What we do here is we ask faculty and staff to come, and um, one way to say it is to provide a little peek under the hood, basically to go beyond their impressive titles, their impressive achievements and things, and to explain a little bit about what drives them, what are their beliefs, values, uh, motivations. Uh, often we hear about uh, their personal history, and not just the highs and the awards and things, but also the lows, which of course do a lot to uh, form who we are. And in doing this, we hope that we will see that we're quite a diverse community, but also we have a lot of bonds in common, and uh, certainly in the past we've seen that in a lot of fascinating talks, and I'm sure there'll be another one today. Uh, some sort of housekeeping details. Uh, this is being filmed, so if you don't want to be on camera, you should not sit in the front. There's a few seats in the back, so you just move on back there. Um, if you have a lunch, please clean that up when you leave. Um, we like to keep this nice, fairly intimate space um, clean so that we can reuse it again next year. And also, you, as you came in, we're given a questionnaire. Uh, please fill it out. We read every single one of your comments. Uh, from you know what you think of the food to um, who you suggest hearing from next year. So uh, please do fill that out. I would say that we do already have a great speaker list for next year. So those of you who uh, are sort of regulars in this series, look forward to that. And those of you who aren't, uh, be on the lookout for an email, which will come three weeks before the first talk next year. Uh, this is, as I say, the last talk of this season um, is a little bit of a tradition. That I like to recognize all the organizers of What Matters to Me and Why. They're not all here, but they've uh, done a fantastic job. So uh, if you are an organizer, maybe you could stand and we could all uh, thank you for your work. <clears throat> Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And finally, uh, I will then ask uh, Professor Claire Yu, who is one of my colleagues, not only on the organizing committee, but also in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, to introduce our speaker. But just before that, uh, please take a minute, 60 seconds, to uh, introduce yourself to uh, someone sitting next to you. Let's, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Kenneth Cheng uh, for this last talk. And, and I think maybe we've saved the best for last uh, for this season. Um, he was born in New York City, um, and he went to Brown University, where he majored in biology and then stayed for his medical degree. Um, he then came to UCI for a fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology, which is study of the liver. Uh, and after th that fellowship, he, we realized he was so good we had to keep him, so he stayed on to join the faculty here at UCI in 1991, where he is now um, a professor of clinical medicine chief of the division of gastroenterology, head of gastrointestinal oncology, and chief of endoscopic ultrasonography, or ultrasounds. He holds an endowed chair in gastrointestinal endoscopic oncology, um, and he is now the executive director of the H.H. Chow Comprehensive Di Digestive Disease Center. So, Basically, he's an expert doctor on everything that has to do with your digestion, um, the stomach, the gut. Uh, he's the guy you want to see. So he is consistently on the list of best doctors of America, super doctors, physicians of excellence, etc. He has a list of uh, awards and accolades. It would take me the whole time to read, so I'm not going to do that. Um, he has appeared on the television show The Doctors. He has over 200 publications, um, both journal articles and book chapters, and his expertise really is in developing medical devices for which he holds a number of patents. Uh, he likes to miniaturize the medical devices um, to make them less invasive, and he is 
Um, among other things, pioneered endoscopic ultrasound for such use, for use in such things as diagnoses, biopsies, and um, anti-tumor treatments. Um, he's always sort of pushing the envelope, you, the cutting edge. He uses lasers and cryoenergy, which is in some sense freezing with liquid nitrogen and other very cool things to bring you know, the, the leading edge of technology, combining it with clinical medicine to sort of give us the very best in the forefront of uh, medicine here at UCI. And you can tell us from the long list right there on the screen. So with no further ado, thank you, Dr. Chang. Thanks so much, Claire, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here amongst uh, the UCI family. Uh, a lot of uh, old friends as well as uh, new faces. Uh, so thank you for, to the organizing committee for your kind invitation. Uh, I must say this is probably the most difficult lecture that I've ever prepared for uh, at UCI, uh, bar none, I think. Um, the organizers have asked and I've reluctantly agreed to share with you my inside story. Uh, not just achievements, but my struggles and my failures and the events that have shaped my life and my worldview. Uh, so in the next 25 minutes, uh, I will attempt a uh, deeper level of transparency with you, sharing with you memories, values, beliefs, and some very personal life lessons. Uh, I thank you for being here. Um, it's my hope that something I say may resonate with you, perhaps challenge you, or hopefully encourage you in your own journey. Um, so uh, a uh, historical geographic map of my family roots. Um, my parents grew up in di different parts of China. My, my father uh, was a son of a general in Henan, China, and then they moved to Taiwan. My mother was the f uh, daughter of a pastor in Guangzhou and then moved to Hong Kong. And they both independently immigrated to Northern California in their 20s. Dad went to Berkeley, they met, they were married, and then soon after moved to Brazil uh, to help uh, my grandfather who fled there, uh, the war in China. So my brother uh, was born in Brazil and I was conceived in Brazil, but my parents uh, f flew to New York uh, to uh, visit with Grandpa Minister so that I could be born as a U.S. citizen. I think they call it um, anchor baby or passport baby, so that I'm one of those anchor babies. Um, so soon after being born in uh, New York Infirmary, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, we then uh, went back to Brazil, and uh, we lived there until I was five, and then we moved back to New York uh, where uh, I started my, uh, my uh, educational career, so to speak. So here we are in Brazil uh, in an obscure cow town called Vacaria, which means dairy, uh, just uh, outside Sao Paulo. I looked, at t even today, the total population is like 50,000, so it's a very small rural uh, countryside. And um, so I, what, I, what do I remember from age five is they had these crazy churrasco barbecues where they took a full side of slab of beef and put it on an open fire pit. And people brought their own, you know, carving knives. And, uh, and that, was, that was the uh, uh, gathering. Uh, we played lots of soccer. So th those are some of the memories from Brazil. Uh, here we are in, in New York City. Um, we moved to Queens. Um, there on the top right is uh, Pastor Grandpa, who founded the first New York Chinese Baptist Church in New York City, Chinatown. And on the lower right is uh, General Grandpa. Um, my dad, he, um, he owned a small stationery store in the Bronx. Uh, the Bronx with, you know, shotgun under the counter and, uh, <laughs> and long hours. Um, he would work typically uh, until they closed the shop at 10 and then he would drive home and he would, wouldn't be home till 11. Um, but like a good family, we all waited for him for dinner. So dinner for us was around 11 o'clock at night. Um, here's my elementary school, PS 178, uh, where I first learned the English, English language. I'm still learning the English language. Um, and there I experienced uh, falafel, banana pancakes, and bar mitzvahs, <laughs> and, and uh, I became the uh, guardian of the school. Um, 
So when I got to my senior year at Port Washington High School, my guidance counselor asked me to see him in his office and he said, so what colleges are you going to apply for? I hadn't the faintest clue. My parents who were immigrants didn't know the first thing about the college game and I was looking at some of the community colleges. Uh, you should apply to the Ivy Leagues. You've got a you know, 5.0 grade point average and you should apply to the Ivy Leagues. Having never heard of the Ivy Leagues, I responded, I don't, I'm not really interested in plants. Uh, <laughs> He said, no, 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 the, you, know, the, you know, these are amongst the top schools in the East Coast. And he, and he literally handed me a stack of applications. So I went home, I filled them out, and I was going through them at Brown University. You know, there was a little box that said, check here if you want to be considered for the combined undergraduate medical school in seven years. So I checked it off and, and at that time typed in, you know, why I wanted to be a doctor. And I wrote, you know, I wanted to help people, and that was the honest truth. And uh, uh, miraculously, I, I got in. Uh, as a matter of fact, other than waitlisting at Harvard, I got into all of the Ivy Leagues, including Brown's uh, medical school program. And there were 40 acceptances out of 2,000 applications. Uh, so essentially, you're into medical school from high school. Uh, I had no idea um, that that was even possible. And uh, thank God for, you know, Mr. Hart, my guidance counselor, who sought me out and uh, brought me into that office that day. So I graduated Brown undergraduate class of 1981 and medical school class of 85. At graduation, I uh, also got engaged to, to the love of my life, Chrissy, who should be here sh shortly, making her way through the campus, uh, getting a little lost. Uh, <laughs> So I, I uh, and then I stayed at Brown for my internship and my residency at Rhode Island Hospital. After that, I followed my wife like any good husband uh, to come out to California where she attended Fuller Seminary. And uh, then I started my GI fellowship here at UCI in 1988. So next year will be my 30th year at UCI. Um, and it goes to show you, thank you, thank you. So it goes to show you, if you squat long enough, they put you in charge. <laughs> um, so what are my life goals? Um, I really only have two main life goals, love God and love people. Um, I like to review my goals once a quarter, and I have goals for my personal life, and I have goals for the family, and goals for each of my three children, and how I would interact with them, career goals, service goals, spiritual goals. But all of these are subservient to these two main goals, love God and love people. Over the years, 58 and counting now, uh, I've learned to appreciate some guiding principles for my life. Um, and in the time we have, maybe I can share with you maybe four of these uh, guiding principles. Um, and I'd like to share with them with you uh, through some of my personal stories. Um, so first personal story is 1982, Brush With Death. Um, you know, I think about every decade, I don't know about you, but every decade, um, it seems that I'm forced to come face to face with the big question, what is my purpose in life? Um, and a, a lot of times there are these major events that bring us to that hard question. So in 1982, I was in medical school at Brown. Uh, going through some uh, tough period, feeling a little bit uh, depressed and complaining to my friends that, gee, you know, it seems like life is so meaningless and, you know, wishing God would just speed things up and take me home, uh, kind of in a, you know, in, in a very um, cavalier way, I said, you know, maybe I wish I was dead. Uh, so that very night, I almost got my wish uh, while driving in the rain uh, along I-95 northbound from Providence to Boston, Boston. Uh, my car started spinning out of control, uh, smashing into the guardrail on my side of the highway and then the other side of the highway and spinning around. Finally, the car stops, but I realize it's facing oncoming traffic where a 18-wheeler truck is coming towards me. So I tried to start the car and get out of the way. Uh, 
the car was completely dead. Uh, so at that moment, I, I said a very profound prayer, God help me, <laughs> um, and started uh, the engine the second time. And indeed, it, 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 uh, the, the car uh, turned on, and I was able to steer out of the way of the oncoming truck. Um, so that next day uh, was Sunday, and, and, I, and I went to uh, church. Uh, this was my wife's church in Boston, Boston Chinese Evangelical Church. And I was sitting there in the front uh, of the pew at, uh, at church uh, where I got my answer, like, why doesn't God just, like, take me? Uh, the sermon that day went something like this. Uh, your life is not your own. It belongs to God. So if God wanted you dead, he would have taken your life. This is the message. And I'm like sitting there. Okay. Um, you exist for a God-given purpose, one that is good and life-giving. Find that purpose and you will have peace. So like a two by four over the head, you know, God uh, answered my childish uh, question about uh, giving up on life. Um, and he made me realize that my life is not my own. It belongs to him. And essentially, I was living on borrowed time from 1982 forward. Um, I guess when you surrender your life, uh, when your main goal is no longer to maintain control, um, when your main goal is no longer preserving yourself and accumulating stuff, uh, there's some freedom in that. So since that time, uh, whenever I face um, a challenge, something scary, something threatening, I, re I remind myself, and I actually say this to myself, is they can't kill a dead man. <laughs> they can't kill a dead man. In 1982, I should have been dead. Uh, whatever threats or fears or uh, difficulties come my way now, um, it's bonus, right? Um, so with, with that s surrender posture, uh, I think in some ways it's uh, actually served me well in that, uh, you know, I think I can do my job better because I really don't care if I lose my job. Um, or ultimately losing my life uh, because, again, I'm on borrowed time. And in some ways, it's more freeing. In some ways, it allows you to do what's right. Um, so that's uh, my first uh, guiding principle. Number one, your life is not your own. So that, this principle speaks to me all the time. Um, next story. Uh, I have three children. Uh, Kristen, the oldest, is 27. Kelsey is 23. Justin is now 21. In 1999, at the age of three, Justin was diagnosed with autism. Uh, it shook our world. Uh, I still remember Christy and I, after having a consultation with Mark Lerner, we were in the parking lot of the UCI Plaza and in the car, holding each other, crying. Uh, our world just got turned upside down. Um, you know, my career was just getting started. I was recruited to be, you know, the head of GI oncology in the brand new cancer center in 1993. We were working on some very, very novel gene therapy against pancreatic cancer and making significant strides. And suddenly, uh, everything comes to, to a dead halt. Um, and, and, and I, I'm so uh, pleased to see Dr. Lilliman here. He says, call me Bill. Uh, Bill Lilliman here, who at that time was, you know, vice chancellor of health affairs, and he was the big boss. And I remember uh, meeting with him and telling him my story and say, and say I, I need to take time off, but would you consider continuing my salary as I spend time taking care of my son? Uh, I could take a leave without pay. Uh, but, but the resources needed for my son were, were extraordinary. And he was very gracious, and, and, he, he, and he gave me a leave with pay. Uh, and I'll never forget that. Thank you, Dr. Lillyman. 
So, um, um, yeah, three months um, of navigating myriads of programs for Justin, tutors, consultants, medications, IEPs, lawyers, just to give Justin a chance for life. Um, so at that point, I came to this uh, second guiding principle realization that, you know, life, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about you know, my uh, successes, my achievements, what I can accomplish. Uh, you know, I don't know for you, but maybe it's about someone God has put uh, in, in your life, that it's about that person and it's not about you. Certainly for Chrissy and I, suddenly life came to be really about, about Justin. Um, and now <laughs> with my aging parents, life is about dad. Um, um, we recently airlifted him from literally, that's why I canceled last time in March is I had to airlift dad from New Jersey because he was declining uh, very quickly in a rehab center that didn't give him the care that he needed after he broke his second hip and was demented and was now in a diaper and bedridden and bed sores and, uh, and, and confused. Uh, we actually, you know, fl flew him out, mom and dad, and now they're living down the street and He's actually doing quite well. So thank God for that. So, you know, or today my life's purpose is the patient in front of me with, um, you know, who just got the C word. Um, or it's the fellow or resident or the student who is working under my supervision. Um, and especially these days as, you know, these are days in which uh, career-wise we're converging. You know, my goal is really to impart to the next generation, you know, my hope is that, you know, our ceiling becomes their floor. Um, and so this is a strong guiding principle that my life is really not about me. It's about the people that are around me. Um, another story uh, has to do with uh, Taiwan missionaries. So in uh, 1983, I took a year off because remember Brown gave me seven years where I zipped through undergraduate medical school. So I took a year off and spent that uh, in this, uh, the southern tip of Taiwan in this fishing village uh, in this hospital that was built uh, by missionaries. Um, my lovely wife Chrissy just came in. Hi Chrissy. <laughs> um, so in, in 1990, uh, 1983, I spent a year with my mentors, uh, Dr. Frank Dennis, Dr. Tim Stafford, spent their lives in this uh, rural fishing village in Taiwan where they had nothing. Um, so there was a two-bed ICU, it was a 40-bed hospital, uh, and the people were so poor they couldn't afford uh, much of anything. So the whole time we were there, we were always rigging things up and improvising. You know, here we have a very sophisticated, you know, uh, central venous pressure monitoring to measure the pressure uh, around the heart. And there we had a graduated cylinder with a little floating ball taped to an IV pole. And that was our central venous pressure um, measuring device. So. Uh, this uh, spirit of innovation uh, was so strong in that place that you couldn't help but catch the bug. Uh, and so I totally caught the bug and, and uh, appreciated how much uh, innovation can flow when you start with a heart of compassion for the people that you serve. Um, so that's, that's me in, in 1983. Um, so Guiding principle number three, you know, compassion uh, births innovation. Uh, so with that, I came back to the States and, uh, you know, finished my, my uh, residency, went on to fellowship here. And towards the end of my fellowship, uh, I was um, always uh, confronted with uh, patients with terrible diagnoses like pancreatic cancer. Um, so I would actually uh, ask God for insights. You know, I, I, know, I don't know if it's appropriate or not to ask God for medical insights, 
I figured since he made us, he may know a little bit something, and since he cares about this patient more than I do, maybe he'll give me a hint. So I would um, ask him, uh, you know, God, how do, we, how do we find these tumors earlier, and how do we diagnose them faster, and how do we treat them? And so um, God would answer those uh, prayers more often than not. Uh, so one technology that uh, I developed in the early 1990s is uh, combining an endoscope, which can travel inside your esophagus and stomach with an ultrasound probe, which can image using the stomach as a window to look at the deeper organs that are typically very difficult to see, especially back then, like the pancreas. So we were able to diagnose and detect a very, very small early pancreatic cancer and uh, also be able to histologically sample them through these tiny needles while working from inside the stomach. Um, that then led to other innovations of delivering anti-tumor agents and uh, gene therapy and radiation activated um, growth factors that would accelerate the production of tumor necrosis factor delivered by an adenovector. So all of this kept just coming and coming and you know, we were in the front page of the LA Times and um, it's all through this uh, innovation birth through compassion bug that I caught uh, by those Taiwanese uh, missionaries. So, um, you know, how do, we, how do we make pancreatic cancer not a death sentence? You know, how, how do we cure esophageal cancer how do we create a colon cancer-free Orange County? Uh, those would be the questions, and those are actually the three vision statements for our entire center. Um, uh, so I, I'm putting everyone you know, on the same vision uh, for, uh, for treating uh, patients with these horrible diseases. Um, so let me give you maybe a case example of, of what we do now in our center on, on a daily basis. Um, so here's a case of a patient who was told that you have Barrett's esophagus, which is precancer in the esophagus from acid reflux, and possible early cancer. And with permission, uh, Mr. Block, who owns a beautiful French restaurant uh, out in the desert, uh, he was faced with this very uh, diagnosis of precancerous Barrett's and po possible early cancer. And this is his lovely family. So he was given the standard options. Uh, we can do surgery and take out your esophagus, uh, or we can repeat endoscopy every three months until we're, for, we're sure it's cancer, and then remove your esophagus. Uh, so just imagine if we had a tiny microscope that we can take with us uh, through the slender uh, endoscope that we just slipped through the mouth and in, into the esophagus. And just imagine we can do microsurgery and completely remove the early cancer and then use heat or freeze energy to remove all the precancerous cells and, and you get to keep your esophagus. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, so this is uh, Mr. Block's uh, endoscopy. That's the esophagus that we're going to be traveled down uh, through the endoscope. And that dark stuff is the precancerous Barrett's, but that uh, nodule is uh, very suspicious for early cancer. Uh, so then we uh, zoom in, and then we have a, um, essentially a catheter that is a microscope that can uh, touch up against the surface of that nodule. And here are the individual cells. This is, this is the precancer cells away from the nodule, and this is the cancerous cells right on the nodule. So in vivo, real-time uh, microscopic diagnosis on the spot, on the fly. So immediately, without even taking a biopsy or sending to a specimen to pathology, we go on to the next part, which is staging, using endoscopic ultrasound to look at the extent to see if that cancer has spread deep, and thankfully it has not. And so again, on the same uh, outpatient procedure, we have, have this special microsurgery device that can uh, suction, lasso, and remove and cut the cancerous tumor. Um, so then we go back into the esophagus uh, once it's healed. Um, and now we just have to deal with the precancerous uh, part. This is the uh, 
Chang cap, which I helped develop. It's radio frequency that's uh, delivered uh, through this uh, paddle-like device, and we could uh, very precisely ablate the precancer cells. And months later, this is Mr. Block's uh, esophagus, completely normal, no cancer, no precancer, and he gets to keep his esophagus. So finally, uh, maybe my fourth and last point is family matters. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of interviewing many, many uh, folks who are at the end of their lives. Um, and, you know, in that setting, I've never heard anyone ever say, you know, I wished I worked harder or published more papers or made more money or lived in a bigger house. I've never heard any of those statements. But what I hear almost all the time is, I wish I spent more time with my family, with my children, with my spouse, and with my close friends. Um, here we are at a cooking class celebrating Kristen's 27th birthday. That's Justin in the red shirt now. He's 21. <laughs> uh, here we are with uh, Kristen and her boyfriend, uh, just uh, enjoying our time with them uh, because it's so precious. Here's mom and dad as we land in LAX after <laughs> air, literally airlifting them from New Jersey. Uh, it was quite a ride. So, you know, family is not always easy, but it's always worth it. Uh, taking care of my father, who, as a typical Asian father, didn't um, really connect with us emotionally when we were growing up, uh, never came to baseball games or soccer games. Um, we were always fearful of him. And, and now at 85, I get to tuck him in uh, and I get to hear him say, I love you many times. So family matters. Um, so these are some of my life's uh, guiding principles. Um, you know, thank you so much for listening and listening with your heart and letting me share a bit of myself. Um, this is our new Comprehensive Digestive Disease Center. Uh, we will be moving in four weeks, and the grand opening uh, is August 19th, and you are all invited. Uh, please come and, and share this uh, ce celebration of, uh, of this center, which I think embodies you know, a lot of what I share with you today. Thank you very much. For, for questions, uh, there any, and there are microphones uh, around, so please wait for the microphone because we'd like to get your question on the video as well as be able to hear it. So there, yes, here's a question up front. Oh, so he's got the. So how's Justin today? Justin is doing very well. Um, you know. Uh, Chrissy and I are so proud of him. Um, he's uh, been through special ed. Um, he's in an adult transition program, um, but he's, um, he's always got a smile in his face. He's always got a song in his heart. Um, each morning um, when I walk down the stairs, he says, good morning, Dad. Mm -hmm. And I'll go over and hug him. And, and uh, I've been getting into the habit of of saying a prayer for him each, each, each and every morning. And recently I've asked him to pray for me and that's been very interesting too. So um, he's, um, he's doing well. I, we're trying to figure out now, you know, can we get him to semi-independence? And actually the UCI family has been tremendous because we just met with the head of facilities at UCI Medical Center. Turns out, there's a huge need. They have all of these architectural plan, uh, plans that need to be sorted. And Justin loves to sort. <laughs> so we've got a job for Justin. Um, thank you for asking. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, thank you so much for rescheduling. This was well worth the wait. 
Um, I really appreciated uh, your talk, and I'm so glad your parents are doing well after the air lift. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, how do you imbue that compassion to innovation to students, residents, and fellows that might not have had that um, uh, exciting experience that you had mm. with the Taiwan Missionaries? Yeah. Um, we have fellows, we have uh, 13 fellows and we have three uh, advanced fellows and often these are international. So we have fellows spending two years with us from um, China, Korea, uh, Japan, Australia, UK. And so they, they hang out with me for two years. Um, and I, I think they catch the bug. You know, they, they, they see these patients in clinic with awful d diseases, complex situations, unsurmountable. A and I think they, they, s they see me struggling and not accepting no and say, well, what, what about this? Do you, you know, what do you think about this? Do you think we can do that? Do you think that may work? And, and we, we literally, you know, th they don't know when I ask them these questions, do I not know? Or I'm testing if they know, right? <laughs> and most of the time, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> so you know, I like to dialogue with them and and get their wheels turning. So, oh, you know, yeah, maybe th that, that may work, or they or they may challenge it, or they may come up with an idea of their own. So so I think this this thing can really be contagious. Um, you know, when we especially when we interact, you know, uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So it's really caught, yeah. Other questions? So um, do you think Brazil plays an important role in your identity and in your life? I'm sorry? Uh, but do you think Brazil plays an important role in your identity? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, you know, recently I, I, I was invited to go to Brazil and speak at a few uh, universities and um, I got to meet my relatives that I had not seen in 50 years. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a part of my family root that, that I just kind of lost track of. So I, I, think, I think yes, uh, I, I don't know if I could quantify it, but I think, um, you know, a lot of Latin America culture has been somehow ingrained you know, the Asian culture has emphasis, and, but the Latin American culture has different emphases and uh, friendship and uh, is very, very strong. Loyalty is very, very strong. Uh, so I think that s subtly has, has formed me as well. Uh, it's not as obvious to me, though. Thank you for sharing um, your heart with us. I'd love to know what project you're working on now that's intriguing to you. Hmm. So, uh, several. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're working on is, is the obesity epidemic. You know, obesity is not just a cosmetic thing. Obesity is now going to soon surpass smoking as the leading cause of cancer and cancer deaths. So that is an alarming statistic. And if you, if you looked at the map of the United States, the obesity rate year by year is going through the roof where some states in the United States, you know, over 35% of the adults are obese. Um, so we have a comprehensive approach to obesity, including behavioral modification, uh, exercise, uh, me medications, but what, what I'm working on is minimally invasive or non-invasive te technologies uh, to decrease appetite uh, and, and, and reduce weight. So um, we're the first in the West Coast to, to de develop this endoscopic technique to actually conform the stomach through, through sutures that we can place inside with the scope and reduce the stomach to much, much smaller and the patient doesn't feel hungry and loses 50 pounds. So, so that's, to me, uh, exciting because that's the pre-cancer, pre um, along with uh, you know, many other technologies. The other, the other exciting area that we're working on is, 
is acid reflux. So we're talking about esophageal cancer and the precancer is Barrett's, which now we've pretty much got a handle on being able to eliminate it. Uh, but now we're going to the pre-pre situation with acid reflux. Everyone's on these PPI medications, and now we're finding out that they're causing a lot of problems health-wise. And so now we've developed three or four different technologies through the scope to tighten the loose sphincter and treat the GERD, which then you tr prevent the Barrett's and you prevent the cancer. Um, so that's also a hot, hot area. Thanks for asking. Another question back. Hi. Hi. Um, so looking through the lens of innovation, what's the direction of the medical education system, especially the curriculum? Um, I think a lot of education is kind of still antiquated, and where would you see the direction going? Yeah, so interestingly, great question. So in our new center, uh, we're spending $1.5 million on just integration, meaning that a student, a resident, a fellow uh, can be in the class, we have a, our own classroom actually, and on a 85 inch 4K high def monitor, they can watch any of the procedures in the building and talk to the, to the surgeon uh, and then we can beam that across campus or across the world. Uh, so now with a turn of a switch, we, we can be interacting with Asan Medical Center in South Korea and, and broadcasting you know, these uh, cases for teaching purposes across the oceans. Um, so this takes telemedicine to, to the next, next level. So I, I think that that training aspect is is uh, is critical. So. Other questions? Yes. Could you have more? <laughs> <coughs> um, are you doing any research with the gut and Parkinson's disease? Interesting. Um, there's a lot of work in microbiome. Uh, gut flora, and it's connected to many, many different things, um, including uh, dementia, including heart. Um, I don't know specifically in terms of Parkinson's. Um, we are not specifically connecting those two at this point. Um, but obviously there's an interest, right? You know, yeah. I'm reading a lot about it. My husband has Parkinson's. Yeah. And I'm reading a lot about the vagal nerve mm. uh, connecting the gut to the dopamine yep. and uh, they're actually doing surgery on it in Sweden. So I wasn't sure if ah. here if we're doing any kind of research uh, based on that. I just know that his stomach gurgles all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so whether, I have no idea, but I've been really doing a lot of research on it. Yeah, yeah, if you, whatever, if you have information you can pass, I'd love to oh, sure. look at it. <laughs> One thing I was wondering is, Many of these um, inventions you've discovered, are they um, spread nationally and t or, or do we have a corner on the market or how does that work? Yeah, the, there's always, you know, this um, tension between, you know, sharing everything uh, and, and owning a market share, right? <laughs> um, but, but I think our greater mission is, 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 um, is proliferation of knowledge. So. Uh, for example, the endoscopic ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, that is now across the planet. Uh, if you go anywhere in the world, you know, they're doing it now in, in, the, in the center, the high volume centers. Um, so a lot of these things really need to proliferate. I, I remember, you know, 30 years ago, when we were working with, the, you know, this in, or maybe it's 20 years uh, in China. You know, in China, they didn't, at that time, they didn't have the resources for high technology but a scope with an ultrasound and a needle, no issue, right? And so uh, we were training then the pioneers uh, in China, um, and, and now they're you know, world experts. So you know, I, I think all of these things need to really be shared. Um, obviously, uh, we, we try to then keep the leading edge going, so we're always you know, maybe uh, three to five years ahead. 
uh, and that gives uh, UCI an ongoing edge. Um, it is a, you know, medically it's a competitive marketplace now. Um, but I, I think we can be very, very proud in the area of digestive diseases and digestive cancers that, you know, we lead not only Orange County, but uh, arguably Southern California. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Are there any other questions? If not, I think um, we're going to end it here, and let's just thank Dr. Chang for a fantastic talk. <laughs>